Good evening. Welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. So my yep. first album is Cheap Trick at Budokan. I was only, um, let me see, I think I was six or seven years old and my older sister played Cheap Trick at Budokan on her turntable and I loved it. It, it. it went beyond Want You to Want Me. I love Hello There. It had a simple, memorable, happy sound and I loved it. Uh, and um, that album is everything to me. And uh, if you want to, if I can gap, if I can bridge the gap, I'm going to Robin Zander gives me his stage played signature model guitar, signs it to me. And this is the other part of it that's pretty fun and cool. What's your favorite, this album? I, I heard them all at the same time. So it's not like I was listening mm -hmm. to them as they were released. So I don't have a, a bunch of, uh, you know, a lot of people cite a bunch of the old greats like ACDC, Back in Black. I, I love, absolutely love all of those. But but I'm gonna... I'd say one of the the biggest uh, influences on me was uh, Avenged Sevenfold City of Evil. When that came out, I was about 14 or 15. And I had been a really big fan of Waking the Fallen before that. And there wasn't mm -hmm. a whole lot of crazy guitar on that album. And so when City of Evil came out, I remember I just saw it at Hot Topic. I bought it just because I loved Avenged Sevenfold already. And I put that on in the car, like my headphones, like in the back seat. And I couldn't, I was like, just in love from the, the very first note, just starting out with that guitar solo on uh, Beast in the Harlot all the way through MIA. I would sit and I would listen to that CD over and over on repeat all day long. My mom heard that through my door all the time, would hear me playing it. It really inspired my guitar playing just to see a new kind of generation, a newer, younger band shredding on guitar. That really influenced me to be able to think that I could play like that too, because before that it was, it wasn't a lot of- There weren't guitar, guitar solos. Yeah, guitar, guitar solos were killed. They got mm -hmm. killed so in the So Black game. Album, I'll be that unpopular person. Uh, you, there's only 125 <laughs> gazillion of, course, of you. I grew up, I like loved it. all of them. You know, I, I grew up with Red Lightning and Master Puppets, like I said, I, all of them, you know, listening to all of them at once. But really, uh, when I was probably about the same time as, like, when I got into City of Evil, I was sitting, you know, I was always sitting on my computer, which was also, you know, my parents' computer. They, were, they would, my parents would download their music you know, onto the computer and I use the computer for school and everything. So I would sit and I'd go and I'd listen to all the music and that's how I really got to hear a bunch of the stuff that I ended up getting into. But I just remember the Black Album was on there and I just I could listen to that nonstop, just all the time, just really, really got me into Metallica with that. What's your favorite Maiden album? Well, it's hard for me to have a favorite because I, I literally listen to them kind of all at the same time, but they, I, I love them all. And so it's, yeah. It's kind of different for me. If it didn't come out when I was, you know, older and, and I wasn't grabbing it when it first came out, it's all just kind of mixed in together. My second album was, it probably came out right before it at Budokan was Kiss's Destroyer. Once again, I'm the youngest of seven kids. The older brothers and sisters listen to Kiss and Destroyer struck a chord with me, liter literally and figuratively. Um, I was enamored with the album cover. I'm like, who are these guys from outer space? All the stuff. <laughs> and uh, funnily enough, you know, not all the songs were dark and gloomy. God of Thunder scared me, you know, cause I was six or seven. That was a scary song when you're six or seven. Um, but then the other songs had this kind of happy shouted out loud and flaming youth and kind of like cheap trick. I was like, this is fun the way this sounds. Uh, so I, Kiss Destroyer uh, is their best album in my opinion. And Kiss has a, a a spotty career because they got some awful albums too. Um, but that is probably their best studio album from the 70s, in my opinion. I'm going to take I, it in a totally opposite direction there. Uh, anything's opposite to this. Yeah. <laughs> Nirvana's Nevermind. Short songs, short, powerful. No, not many guitar solos. Uh, Didn't need guitar I, solos. I just, yeah, that one didn't need it. That was probably one of also probably that and City of Evil, probably the top two most influential albums on me. I uh, just loved Kurt Cobain's voice. I don't know why. I just, when I heard that, awesome. I just became totally obsessed with Nirvana, 
throughout my whole high school years. And I remember I just kept going and getting everything I could Nirvana. I think I started out with that one and then I got all of the demos, all the albums and, and Bleach. that really, yes, I love Bleach too. Bleach is that awesome. Was, yeah, totally underrated too. And I just, that really got me into playing guitar. I don't too, it's just like, you know, I don't know. I mean, you did subdivisions. Didn't you? you did a cover of subdivisions, wasn't it? You did with the great, with the great William Shatner. <laughs> oh, he's so awesome. Yeah, and it's such a great cover too. I mean, you know, it's a whole great album. You know, okay, Digital Man. The whole thing is awesome. But um, how'd you approach? Actually, just good leading. How'd you approach that cover? Like, when you do covers to begin with, like to get the sound. Do you go in and figure it out yourself, or do you kind of get hints or you know, reach out to the people? How you it, approach it that? Depends. What happened with that at the time, Heaven Below was doing an EP called Sleeping Giants and each member got to pick a cover. Of course, I picked a Judas Priest song. Our drummer said, I'm gonna pick Rush. <laughs> and I was like, badass, we're gonna do Temples of Syrinx or we're gonna do Free Will. And he's like, no, we're gonna do Subdivisions. I'm like, oh man. I said, how the hell am I supposed to say Subdivisions? And I had just recorded with William Shatner less than a couple months before that and Shatner had probably with Adam I, right was like Adam doing an album yeah yep. and Shatner Shatner did the obligatory if you ever need anything from me son don't feel free to reach out and right as I had told Shad our drummer how am I going to say subdivisions oh the light bulb exploded and I was yeah. like oh my god we gotta get William Shatner to do the subdivisions part so uh I think I called Adam first and then we connected with Shatner and it was it was a yes inside of 45 minutes. And for him to say subdivisions wasn't enough. We need to have him do the, I was, my brain was going crazy, sparking the ideas. I was like, we got to have him say the end of temples of Syrinx, attention planets of the solar federation. Of course he has to say that and we're putting it in the fucking song. And he did and we did and, and people went crazy for it. And Shatner That's even, awesome. he tweeted it out on his, uh, on his social medias to his gazillions of people. And it got it got a little buzz and, it, and all the Rush um, fan sites loved it. And as you know, people like us, when we're into something, it better be done right. If you're gonna do a Priest cover or Rush cover, it better, it better kick ass. And uh, we got a lot of love for it. Yeah, it and was yeah. Aerosmith's Rocks. Once again, yep. straight right out of the crib for me. Um, all those bands were playing, all those classic 70s bands were loud in my house. I didn't even know what they were. Uh, and I did take to Aerosmith Rocks, um, the beginning of Last Child. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm dreaming tonight. And I just thought it was so cool. And the way back in the saddle sounds, um, I didn't really know who they were or what they were. My sister played that a lot. And that album carried over into me discovering bands listening to Motley Crue and going, oh, they like that album. Motley Crue likes rocks. Oh, Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses. They like rocks. I hear it Rat, in there. walking the dog. <laughs> yeah, the, that album rocks is a rough, kick-ass, greasy, sleazy rock record. And all those bands, the Crue, Guns N' Roses, um, Buck Cherry. I mean, anytime you hear any of that stuff, it's, it's Aerosmith Rocks, straight up. It is. Nice. Uh, I'll say Iron Maiden's Power Slave. Oh, it's so said they they kind of change depending, but usually it's it's always Power Slave. I, you know, I know all every song on that album. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. Like I mean, Power Slave, Ace is High, Two Minutes to Midnight, uh, Flash of the Blade. Just every song, consistently so good on that album. My first Maiden album, so I, I agree. Somebody oh, asked me the other day. They said, you know, what do you, you mean? They said "Name your favorite, name your uh, favorite album I made." And I'm like, I'm like, first off, I go, I can't. The first thing I said, I said, but if I had to choose two right now, it would be um, uh, that one, and and uh -huh. the, the new, the comeback one, the Brave New World one. Those two, yeah. only because they represent different times, but they're both yeah. strong in their own way. So I felt at the yeah. time that's kind of a good mixture. Yeah, you're right. You can't just say one. It's so hard to have one. It's like potato chips. You just can't. Yeah, like today I've been listening to uh, Seventh Son a lot today. I've been yeah. had that on repeat because we're learning some new songs from some of these albums. And I just I love that one too. I know a lot of people didn't like it with the keyboards and everything. I can but say the keyboards. I yeah. 
It stands uh, up though, because yeah, yeah she, I hear her play it, and I didn't like it when it came out. I didn't hate it, but I was like too keyboardy. Really cool song. No, there's good really, song, great songs on it. Really great guitar parts yeah. in, in that one. Like one of these songs we're learning off the of Seventh Son right now. I, I was never really that familiar with this particular song, and it's so fun. Lots of really cool guitar harmonies, Which lots song? of dueling guitars. I'm not saying yet. Oh, it's a surprise for the main okay. set. Surprise, surprises are good. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, Patrick, maybe for you and I, when you say it, it holds up, and I was looking back, I'm like, man, it's a good song. I didn't appreciate. It. I almost think back then I was listening to like it was all about guitar. I've heard any keyboard. Like I love deep. I love Deep Purple now, but at the time I, I didn't like him as much. I'm like, oh, keyboard sounds like hockey music. You know what I mean? You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> the break, yeah. It, the organ. It didn't for me. I was totally either pop because I, I did I, my other thing was like I like like pop music you know, like Prince and and, and Duran Duran like because pop was so different back then and metal and, and guitars and it had to yeah. be totally live so keyboard to me in metal kind of felt like it was just taken away from the guitar time like it, it should have been all guitar yeah and I agree with you but but looking back now I've gotten to the like yes and stuff and I hear keyboards and the layering and and what you can do with it the sonics you know I'm like yep. I was shortchanging myself back then because Exactly. Yeah. It, you know, because you're right. It, it, the album is fantastic, and the keyboards are fine on it. But I think like that album too. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. yeah. All right. So well, actually, so do you, I don't remember your numbers now because you didn't have an order. Would it be your Priest album or your Accept album or the Priest? I think the Priest would be the next one chronological. I got a good simple story about it. Uh, yeah. Growing up in San Antonio, Texas, we had a very influential radio station. Uh, that's still there called 99.5 Kiss. And we had a, a, a very famous uh, DJ named Joe Anthony. He was famous for breaking Def Leppard, Rush, and a new band from England at the time called Judas Priest. He played them before the rest of the country and those bands went on to be huge. So those were huge markets for them down there in San Antonio. And um, Judas Priest played one of their first handful of gigs ever was San Antonio because they did open for Zeppelin in California in 77, but shortly after they did play San Antonio. So they already had a stronghold before Hellbent for Leather came out. But my sister used to spin Hellbent for Leather and it was life-changing because I was into the happy, yay, fun, uh, mm -hmm. rock and roll all night. I want you to want me, you know, and of course the cool Aerosmith, but Judas Priest was definitely the first heavy metal that I heard. Um, I remember, her spinning Hellbent for Leather. And, you know, it's all fast. And I'm like, what the fuck? It's like, it's kind of scary, but kick ass. And I remember looking at the back of the album cover. I'm seven years old at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see the singer is holding a microphone. He's got muscles. And I'm like, that's what a man looks like. That's what a badass man looks like. How funny he turned out to be gay. But that was one of my, and I heard his voice doing the whole help and for the Lord. like I was like this guy is a maniac he's a mean badass man it was Rob Alfred <laughs> uh, he is so that sounds first... fantastic huh oh god that album's so fucking good uh it has a perfection that Black Sabbath did not have um Black Sabbath definitely invented heavy metal with the help of some other things like Zeppelin and and probably that band that played in Agata De Vida or whatever but the Judas Priest was a new level because drums were going to take it to get to get to get to get to get to get heavy accents. The guitars were going to get to get to get to get more than space trucking or more than, you know, some of the deep purple. It was a new level. And as a seven year old kid, I didn't know that, but I sure felt that. And that was my favorite band since then, 1978 or nine. My favorite band today. You know, it's interesting that album. And as early on, I was big into like giving hell, but Black Sabbath first before actually Zeppelin, and then kind of flipped around because yeah. I really love those first six albums and the riffs. But listen to them, and then like as I got older, and I started listening back. I started doing the thing like, like a backwards deep dive with Priest, excuse me, and with Scorpions, like the really beginning stuff. Ooh, like, and I actually, I really like it. There, yeah. I like the, like, like the, the Tokyo tapes and stuff. It's like totally different. It's right. Love it's, that it's, shit. It's the best shit. It's on a different yeah. level because when you first heard it, because you look back, you're like, that's not really heavy metal scorpions. No, it's not really the same. Once again, it's, it's an evolution of a sound that they had. But those first couple ones and the trance and stuff are so good. But listen to all those and, and how the and how metal kind of changed because a lot of those, even early Jews Priest, you had some songs, but they didn't evolve the same though. 
Oh, all yeah. Sudden, and that really where did it happen all of a sudden? Everyone was just heavy. Fitness. I remember my sister playing um, uh, Taken by Force, and the song was Sales to Sharon. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, the shred solo on that song. It's Ingve Malmsteen before In Ingve Malmsteen probably hadn't even uh, hit puberty yet. Uh, that's serious shredding, that stuff, and it still Billy is. Corbin was supposed to was going to jam with them. And that was the song he was going to do with them or something. That was a story. Like he was, he wanted to do that song or, or that's the song they chose. And he's like, what <laughs> of all the songs? Cause yeah, you got to play that right. It's, it's challenging. <sighs> yeah. It, it, and all the guitar players in the band, they're, they're an underrated band too. Except for those album covers. Someone's got to explain those album covers to me. One of these days I have to sit down. Yeah, and like, you get a pass when you're from another country. Yeah. They don't understand it. It's the same reason David Hasselhoff is huge in Germany and not here. <laughs> they don't, they don't yeah. understand it. I guess I don't know, man. Those album covers just kill me. Like, no, at no point, all the way across, you know, fantastic yeah. inside, but on the outside, I'm like, it's, 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 oh, the gum and the whole, the whole thing. I just, it just feels like nobody was offended. It's so funny. They're just funny album covers. Um, Nikki, how about you? Pantera's vulgar display of power. Nice. And it's so hard to choose. Of course, again, you know, I'm from Dallas. So I grew up listening to Pantera, absolutely loved Dimebag Daryl's guitar playing. And that album, I just, so many songs I loved, like This Love, Hollow at the very end, Mouth for War, Walk. There's just so many killer songs on that. And I just remember sitting at home and I got the tab book and I was just teaching myself how to play all of these songs. So I, just, I loved his playing. And I never got to see Pantera, but I did see Damage Plan, their last show in Dallas on a, on oh, wow. a big festival. So at least I got to see him once, but yeah, he's definitely got, one of my our players. That, that's a good album. I, I saw them, the only time I saw Pantera was for the Cowboys from Hell Tour. And when uh -huh. it was like first coming out, uh, Girl, Girl Estate, it was a record label I was working on, and she says, oh, check these bands out. And I got it, I'm like, Pantera, they did the, uh, the, the foundation, the rock foundation there out in LA back in time. It's forum. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, so I got the tape. I'm like, oh my God, these guys are insane. And like a lot of people would know. So they came to the masquerade in Atlanta and um, they opened up for Prong. I think Prong were doing a Beg to Differ tour. So they came in and they played there just like so awesome. And then um, they came off the stage. I actually saw them play a few times. Next time they came back, they actually, they headlined and Prong opened for them. Same tour, same club. Like oh, literally wow. the album exploded that fast. But for that one, you know, they played and it was fantastic. And because they, they weren't as big, they came off the stage and um, the club I was at, they had a, like a, an, an alcohol test, like a breathalyzer. They just come out with this like in the early 90s. I had just gone there that week, as always, we've seen shows. And um, afterwards, Crazy Solos and Dimebag came off the stage. He came over to the side and I was over there. And we started talking. And he goes, Oh, you know, he starts talking, he sees it, and he wants to try it out. I'm like, I had no cash. I mean, he goes, oh, so he puts money in, he blows into it. He was like two or three times like legally drunk. And he had just got off the stage doing this incredible solo, like to like the place where like flawless, yeah. right? And yeah. he, was, he was so gone, like already. Oh my. And he goes, what? And you know, he does the whole, you know, everything you've seen in the videos, he's totally like that. He laughed. He goes, he goes, no, no, you do it. So he puts more money and he has me do it. And I only had a couple of drinks, real low level. And he goes, what? So he does again, high level. He, he, he punches it and he breaks it. <laughs> right there, he just, some kind of crazy thing and he breaks it they never replaced it the machine never went back in the club again oh, oh my god <laughs> but that was that was my dime bag moment that was uh that was my fun moment with him he was uh he was great okay. he was he was fun and that was he was but he seemed so coherent too i mean the fact that he had that much in him yeah. I, I couldn't he even believe it. Himself well by then yeah seriously <laughs> oh, it was insane and he was played so good too it was like literally no for no but but that album was a great pickup from cowboys it didn't feel like it was a didn't hold back but it felt yep. like a natural progression. It literally felt like it was the next things, you know, was, you know, there's some albums that come out, you're like, oh my God, there's a big, huge step in the difference. Yeah. Like, uh, like Faster Fuzzy Cat's first album and then their second album. It was like a huge, like you're like, it's almost like two different bands. But for those two, they really, you could kind of feel the transition, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a good one. Yes. See, I'm, what happens after the show, I've been listening to albums all week long now. It always happens. Go, that's a good album, man. I got to get in my head now. My, my, I got to go my, listen my song list. again. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Now I got to go listen to all these again. Is that, is that taking order? Is that this order? is going in order. Um, this one, I don't care that it's it's everybody's favorite and that it's like the number three selling rock album. It deserves to be the number one selling rock album. Yeah. Uh, like I said, when growing up as a little kid, my older brother's sisters, I heard High Voltage. I remember hearing Highway to Hell. I remember hearing Let There Be Rock. Loved it. Massive energy. 
Uh, once again, I'm a little kid looking at this guy, little guy with a guitar that looks like he's crazy. Uh, and then I think when Back in Black came out, I was still in elementary school um, and my brother got it. And it was like, where's the crazy kid, the crazy guy with the guitar, you know, and it's a new singer. What happened? I, I was young. I didn't really know. Um, and then you hear Brian Johnson sing with those mm -hmm. crazy badass riffs I think I don't know if Hell's Bells or Back in Black was the first um that album is the meat and potatoes that's the basis the the most concrete fundamental thing that would build a house of rock to me uh and that album it truly does get me going today if I'm tired or if I'm hungover I put on that album and I'm ready to drink and crank it up uh that album's amazing. No wonder it's the production. So the production is I, I don't think people talk about it. I mean, it's, it's it's like it's it's dry, but it's crisp. Like it's you know what I'm saying? It's it's very it's not like a live feeling, but it's so it's like a punchy, it's a dry punch. It's just something about it, it just that really yeah, probably you know, knew how to capture it. He probably obviously he oh, yeah. knew probably how much to tell them to change something versus what to keep. I see their interviews, I know Malcolm kind of ran the show. And yep. so probably that amazing producer with that amazing band with the older brother probably being guarded about what greatness they had. I guess there was no way that wasn't going to be a great album, I guess. I don't but that's, think about that's a comeback album for them. And they literally didn't know they got this other singer in. They went off to like some island. I forgot where they did it. I mean, you just really just they yeah. didn't know. They were pretty much a couple albums out and they weren't that big at the time. You know, there were a couple songs out. But back then they weren't like a band that could live off their albums and their money. They were, you know, a working band. Yeah, that's so, probably the biggest comeback rock, rock album of yeah. all time in terms of numbers and success across the board. Really obvious why. It, it, I, I think it's one of the biggest albums that came out in the rock genre too, like the first big rock album that, that exploded. It, it never lets up till the end, till rock and roll ain't noise pollution. It never lets up. Yeah, there's Shake nothing a, else give there. A dog a bone, all that shit. But I'm thinking like size-wise too, like either Jeff Leppard, you Metallica, it exploded. But prior to that, to the back to black, I can think, I don't know, maybe what? You could call it rock, but maybe Meatloaf spat out of hell because it had some guitar on it and then it, the, yeah. the, the motorcycle. That's probably the closest thing to being a heavy rock album. Boston, that, that, Boston that, was huge with that first Boston album. It was. They, they have a weird career only having a couple albums and every album was so huge and they never really did a lot of touring. Like it was spotty touring and stuff. There was a very Yeah, I guess, I guess that guitar player, Tom Schultz, had other ideas, obviously. Yeah. Back to yeah. my teenage emo years and picking a kind of random one i loved afi's sing the sorrow album and i don't know if you're really familiar with afi i don't know i just absolutely no a little bit of them i don't i did this is being very little doubt so you're schooling me totally in this one because yeah i did they weren't i i i don't even think was that one was sing the sorrow bigger than the miss murder one was, was that one that's a good question those are the only two i actually own from them yeah i i went back after i got them after I got that album and I got some of their previous albums and they were much more raw and like SoCal punk and then Sing the Sorrow was much more polished. Who did they, we said that they, who was that that they produced that one with? It was somebody big. We just looked it up. I just loved every song on that album. It's very, um, I know my parents didn't like that one that much. Um, just super catchy. I loved the guitars. I was always kind of like into the doom and gloom back then. You know, I liked the fun stuff, but I also loved my kind of emo, darker music. And I just, I would listen to that one all the time, all the way through. There's a little hidden track at the very end yep. of the album. And I would sit and I'd be mad because I'd have to go and I'd fast forward it just to get to that. And that was probably one of my favorite songs was the the hidden track. I just remember How far back was it? I know Danzig did it to one of their albums. It was like track 99. And you're like, come on, really? Oh, there was another. Yeah, I remember waking up to another band that would do that to where it was nine inch nails was the first oh, artist yeah. i remember doing that uh, oh, yeah. this AFI one, it was just it was on the same track as the last song it was just mm -hmm. like way later 13 minutes into it of yeah. silence and then you hear like some creepy piano and some whispering and then that one would come on and be like yes there it is finally that's probably probably one of my favorites i love the music videos girls not gray I just, I, every time I put that on and it takes me back to when I was like 13, I just, I love no, that. No, no, they go back one yeah. thing I noticed is we had that on the other day, the AFI, and I was into that album too. I just moved out to LA. Um, and I have to get past the singer sounding a little, yeah. a little funny, but um, I noticed the other day with the guitar riffs and stuff, they're very musical. 
Uh, yeah. They have a lot of odd time signatures. The arrangements on the songs are not Blink-182 crap where it's just like, do this chorus and they go to that. Yeah. They have uh, kind of overtures, segues, like a band like Rush or Coheed might have. Really? Um, and that was the yeah. first thing. I, the other day I go, listen, these guys, this ain't some bullshit. These guys mm -hmm. are playing, they're really playing some badass shit. Now, which album yeah. was that? That, yeah, so, sing the sorrow. Sing the sorrow. I know the the previous ones were more just kind of straight punk, and then that one they were totally different. And then after mm -hmm. that one, I can't remember the name of it. Winter, it was winter. Yeah. Something, but I wasn't I wasn't really thrilled. They went way more poppy on yeah. that one, and mm -hmm. I wasn't. Right, we'll see. We'll see if that's my gateway drug for uh, for, for them. I'll, I'll, Don't I'll check the out. sorrow. You you might yeah. you might connect with it easily because yeah. the music and the riffs are really good. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of people had to get past his voice, but. I just, he would sing, he had a good singing voice and he could scream. I was always into the, somebody that could sing and then scream at the same time. I, I always liked that when I was growing up. Look, if you can, if you can handle Dave Mustaine, you can definitely handle Davey from FI. I do love yeah, Dave. Check it out. Negative, yes, I do. He, yeah, he has to do Dave Mustaine music though, though. He does sound good as Dave Mustaine. I can't imagine him doing like anything but his own music though. No, yeah. that's so true. Yeah. You know, there's certain singers, and I said this before, you yeah, singer, a unique singer that can't do other stuff has their own voice in a certain way and it can mm -hmm. sound great but you got to own your own voice if you you know you gotta know what yeah. you're doing with it exactly um, i know the vinyl so i'm gonna say i, I actually mine would be too fast for love by Molly crew that one that was, of was damn was, good and i remember listening to like over and over like my, my walkman going to sleep every night with that one for like the longest time I always listen to the album over and over and over again you know i can't even pick a favorite song off of it i mean i think i was the show was probably my favorite at the time because Public Enemy to... number one. Yep. Like the Merry Go Round yeah. song. Merry Go Round. Yep. Yeah, I love that one. That one. Well, was the time I had to da 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 cha da da. A very and that's really like a it was like a, not like a jazzy beat, but it was a swing beat. Like da, da, it was da, almost da. like played or sweet. Like if you go yeah. back to early stuff, it was kind of like that. Which I think makes sense because he wasn't he was into the like the raspberries or something. I mean, I love Slade, yep. but he, so he was back into a lot of different bands at the time. Depends on when you talk to him what what his influence was at the time. So now sometimes it changes a little bit. Yeah. But that album was very poppy. Yeah. It was very poppy metal. It was, you know. It was poppy without being polished. I think that's why it why it's so good. Mm. Yeah. Cuz yeah. If you made it too pretty, it wouldn't have happened. But so, but then the change from that too, Shout of the Devil actually, which is actually one of yours, so I'm not going to skip ahead. So we'll end yeah. right. I'll end my stuff on that one. But uh yours is Accept? Is that what it is? It's so small. Which what is one? your next one? Is it Accept? Uh, I guess it would be Accept uh Restless yeah. and Wild. Let me what song see. Off that one? At? I was never a huge fan. Okay. Princess of Dawn, the title track. That that big radio DJ I was talking about earlier that broke Def Leppard, Rush, and Judas Priest. Uh, one night I'm listening to his radio show, and I used to have a, a cassette recorder, and I pulled it against the radio. I didn't mm -hmm. know about technology or that it sounded bad. And he played Fast as a Shark, and that was even faster than what was on Hellbent for Leather. Oh, uh, yeah. The drums like, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then Udo sings, and then the guitar solo was shredding like the Scorpions, but even crazier. Uh, and my mom, it was right around Kraut Rock, like, right? Yeah. They called it Kraut Rock at the time. Do what? The German Kraut Rock. Wouldn't they call it Kraut Rock because of the except the, the Scorpions, Kraut, like German? Oh, like I never heard that. Yeah, I probably read too many Scorpions books. Yeah, the, the except and the Scorpions were Kraut Rock, is what they were saying for a while. It's pretty, pretty funny. Yeah. Except was just bad. It was thrash, I guess. Is that thrash? Mm. Maybe that's the beginning of thrash. Uh, fast as a shark. I think some people might say that. Really fast, really accurate. That. Crazy bridge troll. Uh, you know, the guy from Lord of the Ring vocal, you know. Uh, and I remember I got the album for Christmas. And I loved the whole album a lot. And uh that was, I didn't care whether they were popular or not. You don't care when you're a kid. You just like how it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that one. Yeah. Nikki, yours? Do, let's see, I'll do another emo teenage one. Um, Evanescence Fallen, so their debut album. Um, I got that and it was so, I remember seeing the music video for uh, Bring Me to Life and it was so cool to see this this rocker chick singing and I love you know, at that point what I was I was probably 13 
So after seeing her, I loved her voice and I loved all the creepiness of the music with, and it had guitar solos. I loved the lyrics. I loved everything about it. I would drive my friend crazy just with that album on repeat. I just loved her voice and I loved the lyrics. And right after that, that's when I started dyeing my hair black, got the eyebrow pierced when I got older. She was just such a huge influence on me vocally. And Do you remember when that video came out? It said Evanescence featuring Paul such and so uh -huh. from something stone from 12 stones because 12 stones was set to be the new big buzz band. Really? And I remember this because the guy that yeah. worked with in underground anyway, shortly after that song got so big with Evanescence, yeah. it had it was not so much didn't even say featuring the guy from the band oh. who's supposed to be big. It, it, it kind of oh, I remember wow. that. That's yeah. true. I, I, I mean, yeah, I think that album kind of launched symphonic metal too on some level. That's now this everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think so. I think it really brought kind of that scene to life because after that, I remember going to like our our music store was called Hastings, and I, I think those finally just kind of went away recently. And I would go in there with my mom, and we would just go look through CDs. And I started. That's when I started seeing. I'd pick out something. I'm like, oh, here's another female singer on here. Sweet, and it was. I think. Nightwish. I just bought it. I didn't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just gonna give it a chance. And that's when I did start realizing there's a lot of other bands like that, Lacuna Coil, and mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of a lot of them though do source. And I talked to a few. They they always go back to that album. That yeah, is, is, uh, an album yeah. that really just kind of changed their lives. Yeah, I, awesome. me and my friends would just sit and sing along to those songs all the time. Yeah. I think a good call on that one. It's hard because sometimes, like you know, for vocally for women, it used to be like it was either a clean voice, yeah, or kind of that Pat Benatar voice was as rocky as you got like you know, a while yeah. back, and then you start getting like you know Allison and you get the, the, the thrashy vocals from like you know it totally changed. You could do the deep voice, and so then you just don't know anymore. Then the beds are yeah. off, and then she would be doing this opera voices, you know, and in evidence like everything just totally changed at that point, which was yeah. I think really great for for vocals for women because for a while it was kind of like locked into just pop you know what i mean yep yeah it's very true i thought of it that way i mean if you really look back in the like think of some really 80s metal songs i mean they, they had the range that yeah. alpha could do but you don't really hear it as much yeah pat benatar really loved her voice yeah her stuff is not easy to sing either oh that With holds her. up today Oof. big time when you hear yeah. her stuff that's still kick ass mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And i like the grit on her voice too She's incredible the songwriting was good. It was good pop too, but it was also the, the rock. I think Neil, her husband, you know, the two of them wrote some really good songs yeah. together. Great it guitar and great riffs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it totally made it good. Um, I would say for me, probably Van Halen, uh, uh, the second one, probably my favorite. I, I go back and forth every day. Yeah. I, I, the first one's good. It's over, I don't think overrated because everyone always says it. But there's something about like beautiful girls and they're kind of like feeling it and they were kind of come back off their second tour. So, you know, that album, you know, they tried to redo the magic. It was, it was produced the same. So, I mean, kind of like with Sabbath, like that first set of singers, and those certain albums, they all hold pretty strong together. Yeah. You know? I, I know Diver Down, some people don't feel so strong about. I like it personally, you know, it's kind of like a, an in instrumental break between uh, scenes of a movie, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Van Halen 2, what, that's a good way to put it. It was an extension of the first album. And they, they did that song that I didn't realize till later was a cover. Uh, You're No Good. You're No Good, yep. yep. Great, great song. Uh, and Doesn't that was, say a lot about you, though? If you don't know the song and somebody else does it so well, you think it's them? That says a lot about an artist that you, you own it so much more. Yeah, well, yeah, a lot of times it's how old you are when, yeah, with your awareness at that time. You know, I was a little kid and that came out, too, and I didn't, I didn't know. I remember, is that album with DOA on it? Van Halen 2? Um, Dead or Alive. Yeah, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Someone get me a doctor, I think. With, you know, yeah, funny with, with, with You Know Good is um, Ted Templeman was also producing them. He was also doing Linda Ronstadt at the time. And they were really close. Like she was coming out over oh. his house all the time. It's actually, you got to read Ted Templeman's book. It's really good. He talks about Van Halen, Linda. It's a whole thing. So you can see where that song kind of probably snuck in because he was doing both bands, you know? Yeah. I, you know, he was also doing the Doobie Brothers, so thank God no Doobie Brothers switched into Van Halen because who knows where that would have gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that would have mixed, but yeah, that, that's probably why that song probably kind of came over. It was a good good mix. 
Yeah, I'm that's a good point. I like that you picked Van Halen too. Yeah, a little less obvious than going for the debut. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's hard because you know, obviously, it's, it's good, like you said, but two is just as good and not as overplayed as much. You know, what I mean, it's hard because you hear something that's so good so much, like okay, I need to take a break because you kind of hear it so much. Appetite two, on the other hand, it's too much. I've heard it too much. <laughs> no, I agree. I have it on vinyl. I've listened to it a few times, but I went through a time where I couldn't listen to it for a couple of years because I heard it so much. I listened to it so much. Yeah. Myself. So yeah. Guilty. Um, yep. So that's, that's where I would go with that one. Um, Patrick, do you, I totally lost. I had your list here too. Ah, I think I'm a, head? a chronological headspace. It's probably shout at the devil. Yeah. Uh, I think that one or one more. You have something else to it too. What, what else was around that time? Um, we don't have a few left. It was just you shout the devil. Oh, you had a, Oh, Maiden. How could you forget that? Nikki elbow him. Oh, oh yeah! That oh, came. oh! Yeah. That was a this, number of the beast too. Yeah, this I, my list is full of a lot of firsts. I went with my early introduction to music. Uh, my brother had Killers, and I loved it. It was such a great album. Of course, Killers was great. Uh, I was right. a little kid. I, I'm still in elementary school at this time, and thought Killers was amazing. I loved it. It was like it, it had something in common with the Judas Priest, but was different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I remember my brother said, oh, they they got a new vocalist, you know, he had read somewhere. And so I was out with my mom shopping. And I remember I put Number of the Beast in the shopping cart. And my mom was sweet, you know, that she got me that album, not even knowing that it's Number of the Beast 666. And <laughs> we're a God-fearing Catholic family. Uh, and I brought it home. And uh, I was kind of like proud to show my brother, no, I, this is my maiden album. You got killers with that other guy this is this is the maiden album here and this singer's better you know i'm thinking like that as a kid and uh it wasn't you were right but you were but he he was right though you were right he was a better singer i was blown away i I remember everything uh from the opening track all the way to all of my name the scream that sounds like the who oh yeah yeah. (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah 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 damn good album man yeah. that's my favorite maiden i kind of like y'all i go back and forth that one holds a place because it was my first maiden record that i owned um even invaders and, and gangland those are great mm-hmm. songs you they don't are. think about those invaders. are great invaders yeah, is really bam, bam, well, what's great is it's a whole album you, like you say oh that one i'm like oh yeah, i love that album and you go back and you know scorpions like they're all all these cuts are like full albums and being like everyone we're talking about these are full albums these aren't like you know, there's like three songs and the rest of it's a throwaway album. It's a full album, man. Full you know, album. You're, inve- exactly. you're invested in it. From yeah. Beginning to end. You know all the songs. You get just yeah. excited ones that aren't as popular because you're not burned out on them, you know? Or if you yeah. hear those weird songs in concert, you're like, oh, I think I'm play this one. It, you know, it's, it's great, but they don't have it as a single. That's yeah. always a, a treat when a band did that. Um, yeah, so, we, we, you know, with Maiden, there's just so many I go back and forth with. I, I couldn't really... Even, even fathom where to go. I would say for me, I think for Black Sabbath was one too. The first one, and then um, Never Say Dialect too, I think it was underrated. I would say that was really good towards the end. Was like that the, was our know, last uh, one with Ozzy at the time, right? And they were, hot, they were a hot mess. There were some songs in there. But I just liked the, 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 the groove, the drums, the swing of it. Mm-hmm. I like that it actually sounds different. Yeah. You know? And it's like a band in chaos. Yeah. But it's, but it's heavy, but it has some pop songs in there too. It's like a really weird album for them. Yeah. I like yeah. they've done with mirrors of um, of Sabbath to me, because then yeah, after they go. came out with, because then after they came out with, and they got Dio, they kind of started coming out with, like dehumanize or I'm not doing it in order, but you know what I'm saying then they took it really heavy again. They really kind of shuffled it along, yeah. but uh, that's crazy. Nice, yeah. you Nikki, you're getting, we're getting towards the last couple here. Hmm. He doesn't like when I play them that much, but Megadeth, I love Megadeth. Absolutely. I think Manny is awesome, band. but the vocals sound like this. I'm like, whoa, he's singing like that. Yeah. That's just me. I'm a dick. I I love them. I love all of their albums, but Countdown to Extinction, so, so good. It's a toss yep. up between that one and Cryptic Writings for me. Well, actually, it's hard for me to choose with them. I love Marty Friedman's guitar playing. Just Marty Friedman. High Speed Dirt. Yeah. How, how so, crazy is that song, right? So crazy good. And so between both of those, I absolutely love them. I just remember learning- Rust in Peace? Rust in Peace is the one for me. The Rust in yeah. Peace one? What's, yeah. the, what's the song 
Rust and Peace. What is it? Uh, Lucretia. Lucretia. Lucretia, so Five Magics. Um, for souls. Yeah. Right. Uh, when I worked at Schechter for a brief moment, I kind of got starstruck because Chris Poland came in, oh. pick up a guitar, and I'm like, oh my God, it's Chris Poland. <laughs> so yeah, Megadeth. I, I love all the early stuff. Even I remember United Abominations came out. Mm -hmm. I forget what year that was it must have been maybe 2006 or something I was in was I in junior high or high school and I really loved that album too like all the I had to go back and listen to it but I don't really notice well I'll be honest because like yeah I stopped to count down myself yeah it just it felt like everything was just kind of blurring with them at that point it felt like I don't know it wasn't his original maybe because Marty left after that album too I think right so I think that was the last one he was on yeah, yeah and Russ and, and, it, and Russ was the album for me that like the music is fun. I can listen to the whole album without any vocals. Actually, it's such a good album. Yeah, that's it, you can probably listen to it too. Patrick yeah, got the vocals. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll the vocals so they sound good. <laughs> you gotta do it in the style of. The style of... No, you have a lot of other voices. Don't use that one. He sounds like he sounds like Beavis. Hello, me. It's me again. It sounds like Beavis from was, Beavis and the Butthead. I was so excited when I learned that song. I was like, "Yeah, I'm yeah I'd rather I'd rather hear James Hetfield. Yeah, ha, cha, cha, yeah, yeah. I'd rather hear that." But that's the thing about owning your voice, though. Those they, they couldn't do anything different. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I and know. I, 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 and I, I do think I think I think his voice does go with it with uh, Megas. Stuff, you know, yeah, yeah, but the stronger stuff for me was the earlier yeah. stuff, you know, not because yeah, of any particular amazing reason. player, yeah. great songwriter, all that stuff. I just, I just attack the voice just because I'm a dickhead, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, vocals can <laughs> make a big band zero zero one percent uh success that he has, <laughs> so I can't say anything more, yeah. <laughs> it's you know, it's all about yeah, songs and time, it's different time period too, though, right? It's not the same anymore, yeah. you can't work your yeah. albums the same, you know, yeah, it's all it's totally never gonna be the same anymore um so i i was i said you did my black south once so patrick you motley crew shout the devil yeah my my older brother had a, an advanced copy i guess is what they called it of shout at the devil on cassette like a recorded one from someone he knew in la or something yeah. and i remember him playing in the beginning through his home stereo and i'm like oh shit is this black sabbath is this kiss what is this? And I remember, dun, dun, shout, shout. Dun, dun, dun. And then one late night, I was up late. We just gotten cable TV and uh, uh, looks that kill. Looks that kill. So I saw what they look like. I'd heard it, but then when I saw it, I'm like, oh my God, they look like the Road Warrior, Mad Max meets fucking mm -hmm. a punk band that got attacked by Kiss. Uh, and I, Sold in Mick Mars playing a fucking white DC Rich Warlock. I wasn't playing guitar yet. Uh, that was 82, 83. I was getting ready to get my first guitar. Um, and I asked my mom again. I said, you have to, I have to get this record. And it had the pentagram on it and everything. And I got I the, the vinyl of it. Did you? You know, it's, yeah. it's, like a matte, it's like a matte black on it, but the, the shiny, the pentagram is the black shiny version on a yeah. matte and a black <laughs> version of it. And the beasts were one of the reasons I got expelled and I got out of Catholic school. And uh, they asked my You're the, welcome. The, teachers, the nuns and teachers asked my mom who uh, who bought him these devil albums because it was all about chasing. It was like the Salem witch trials back then, kind of like today. And um, <laughs> they said uh, they said uh, they asked my mom who got him these albums, and my mom said I did. Well, these are devil worshiping albums and he's going to be a devil worshiper. And my mom, uh, being Hispanic, Catholic, very God fearing, um, she thought they were being ridiculous. And I got uh, before they, they were about to expel me. My mom pulled me out of there and put me in public school. So Number of the Beasts and Shout at the Devil definitely helped me with that. And uh, I got wow. a guitar shortly after shout at the devil that really yeah. is influential yeah i remember hearing i was because i was big into van halen at the time and i hadn't heard a lot I, twisted sisters album had just come in you know the bigger album like i did so i'm hearing a lot more rock albums somebody goes oh you should hear molly crew and i'm like oh, i don't really know anything about them and i remember the, I, somebody gave me like just, just a cassette i didn't have the, just no case on it, it was, so it's just i didn't know what they looked like i literally just had the white cassette with the writing on it same thing i heard in the beginning i was like what is this so i had no visual not even the album cover i knew nothing about it just the music for like a week it was just like on my walkman it was crazy it was huge. Crazy. Like we're talking about covers. I remember Helter Skelter. I was like, yeah. that's the best Helter Skelter ever. You know, not that I knew many more. 
of Helter Skelters, but looking back, killer, killer cover. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's mixed guitar playing. I mean, he's so underrated. I mean, you can say how underrated Ab he is in popular, but he'll never get enough credit. I mean, he's just, he's up there with yeah. everybody else. You know what I mean? He should have been huge, huge, you know. So I'm going to agree with that one. Uh, how about you, Nikki? Your last two. We got left. Let's see. Papa Roach. They were one of my favorite bands growing up, still are. Uh, it was hard for me to choose, but the Paramore Sessions mm -hmm. uh, got to be loved forever. Reckless, that whole album all the way through. I would just, I would listen to that all the time. I used to go um, on road trips with, with my friends because I had friends. I was based in Dallas or Austin if I was in college at that point. And I would go, I had friends all over Texas. So I would go, you know, go see Papa Roach in all these cities and hang out with my friends and all these yeah. It was such a fun, I just always have really good memories of that because it was just kind of carefree, just going. I wasn't playing live music yet. So I was obsessed with the live music, just seeing just seeing my favorite bands and their their energy on stage is almost like nobody else that I've seen. Still it felt like very punky, but they, they, they grew up like in rock. I mean, I, I dig a lot of their songs. Yeah. I just, like they, they came out with, they do Kicked in Teeth. They came out for a while, they did that for a while and in yeah. and out. So it always like they were, still trying to be relevant and stuff too they weren't they kind of held their own yeah they their newest album what i haven't kept up with everything that they're doing but was crooked teeth the, no the connection that was a little bit back they did a tour with like motley crew and stuff they did they do some like weird yep. tour like all of them i think that, that song came out and i haven't heard yeah. I, I don't know what they've done recently so that's my bad i know they've probably done something it's just yeah they've still been putting albums out pretty consistently it's They're one of the it's busy. one of the best live bands yes. after 2000 for sure would be yeah. Papa Roach. Yeah. anybody that goes to see them whether whether they only know last resort or not yeah you will walk away from that that show and go oh wow like they, they massive kick, energy kick your ass live yeah well, they, Scar they, they, the song they, scars i think is is, is is epic i mean you can't you can't deny that power yes. of the song scars that yeah. is just yeah. such a beautiful song when they, they do it mm -hmm. broken down too i mean yeah yeah so, they're one of the bands when you see them live you kind of feel dumb if you're sitting there like this watching papa roach i know that sounds crazy because so many of us are so cool but you feel stupid at a papa roach show yeah, like this actually you feel like an yeah. old angry person we saw and, and for whatever it is that jacoby says and the way they play you're like oh no I, i'm into this show i'm we, here i think yeah. that was probably the rowdiest crowd that i've seen in hollywood for a live yep. show we saw them really like years ago, probably not too long before this pandemic, it's the Roxy, the Roxy yeah. and it was sold out what three days in a row or something. Yeah, and we went one of the Good nights. And it, I yeah, I've never seen a Hollywood crowd be so into it, and he he got them totally riled up. Yeah, so I like that. I like to hear that too because I feel like they they hustle, and it feels like they had some record label issues, and the publication was up and yeah. down. It felt like they never got the full, you know, the full swing to get yeah. get the pub push out there. You know what I mean? Yeah, they play, nice they play as if it's their last show. They play as if they're not leaning on the fact that they have hits. Yeah. And we all know that bands will lean on the fact that they have hits. Papa Roach doesn't. They play as if it's the sweatiest, craziest night yeah. of their life. I've seen Every them, time I see them. Yeah, I've yeah. seen them probably more times than any other band. I've seen them more times than I can count. It's it's ridiculous amount of times. And I never saw a show where they didn't bring that same energy every yeah time. they don't they don't turn down underneath 10 it's yeah. everything's always amped up all the way like how does he get that energy every damn night every I time don't know. every time yeah it's crazy See, that's not have to check them out live because i didn't realize how, yeah. how awesome they were live yeah oh they'll blow you away even if you don't know the songs they'll blow you away well i know a lot of them too like i don't get to the albums because i listen after um the last resort is, is okay to me, but I like the last, the a couple after that. Those, I don't know what the titles were, I, but I was listening to those for a while and I really enjoyed those, you know? Yeah. So oh, yeah. I, do, I do enjoy, I do, and I like his voice. Um, yeah, me so. too. I would say I would pick my album would be my Zeppelin. I'm going to say, I'm gonna say Presence. I, I think it's kind of weird. I'm going to say for my album, what about Presence. Off, off that album again? Oh, in the evening? I'd have to actually have to pull it up. Oh, okay. Is that the... Uh... All of my love. Is yep. that that one? Yeah. Yeah. It's got a bunch of weird ones on it that aren't, it wasn't as big an album. I mean, by, by default, it was still big because, you know, once you're that big, the, the current just keeps everything going. Yeah. But looking back, it's when it's again, it's not that big of an album, like overplayed. So you play it on. Is that the album that has bump, 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 
it might be the whole album is, it's, it's all like a mid-tempo i mean every song you know anyhow on that one too but it's a very yeah. mid-tempo album it's not slow it's not fast it's just kind of grooving yeah so, nice. i dig that one nice so um got two left here so metallica i used to hear molly yeah metallica Metallica, yeah. I, I, once again, I don't care that it's it's. I don't. Who cares if it's cool or not cool about to the heavy metal people about Metallica? That band has proved themselves over and over. Um, my first Metallica album was Ride the Lightning. I heard Fade to Black on the radio station from that same guy that broke all the bands, and it was a new level to hear it go. Da, 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 da. It was so crunchy. I was I, I was just starting to play guitar, and I was like, Ooh, I want my guitar to sound like that. Why does it sound like that? And I remember learning the riff da -na, da -na, da -na, da -na, da -na, the end of, of um, Fade to Black. And I remember asking my friends at the time, uh, one of them's Brett Stein, the famous guitar player himself, Scott and Brett Stein. I'll make sure that, that they have to watch this now. I remember being at their house and uh, we were at a party at their house or something. And I was like, how is Metallica gonna follow up Ride the Lightning you know, with Creeping Death and all that, it's so heavy and so in your face, there's no way that they're gonna have an album that's gonna be like that. And then I think Scott Stein played Battery uh, on the turntable and I was like, oh, that's how you follow, <laughs> that's how you follow for Ride the Lightning. And I, it, mind blown, just just the riff. I hadn't even heard it, that was the first album. By them, because I was listening to Motley Crue and Van Halen and stuff. My buddy, you know, harassing me, but he was listening to Metallica. He goes, "Oh, you need to listen to Metallica, Master of Puppets, and, and all the other albums." He said, "I go Metallica." I go, "Is that like punk rock or something?" And I say that now because he loves to bust on me about that, so I'm just gonna put it out there already. <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, yeah. that punk rock stuff." He's like, "You need to listen to it." And then, of course, you know, Master yeah, of Puppets just went, and I went backwards. Yeah, a yeah, lot the of the album is totally different. Yeah, it, it was a game changer. It took uh, it took the heaviness of Ride the Lightning. It put a little more emphasis on arrangement and structure on disposable heroes and leper messiah different time signatures for us that are paying attention to that and yeah. uh i don't know and then it ends with with damage incorporated right it's the last song mm -hmm. on the album i mean it's fucking killer right. but did they open it but imagine but the sound of them back then there was nothing like them and mm -hmm. being so big remember they're like they were on like rolling they became the cover of rolling stone but there's no other albums compared to you're like when you listen to it you're like or then they, they open for Ozzy, which is such a big difference in sound. I mean, nowadays, yeah. maybe a little closer. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But that was like, what's the park? It was the second, it was the um, Ultimate, Ultimate Sin, wasn't Sin. it? Which is a very poppy album. Yeah. Outside people of, must. You take, off, you take, take, take the guitar off of it, and it's not a metal album at all. Yeah. People you know must I mean? have been confused when Metallica was on because it's so heavy. But, it, you know, if you're really into them, you know all the in intricacies within the mm -hmm. songs and the sound. Um, yeah, that. But that you know, there's is, the Ozzy, and everyone's wearing glitter and stuff, and then Metallica yeah. come on in their jeans. Were people waiting for some bat biting bullshit? Um, no, that's the best Metallica album. I'm, I think it is. If you if you said you can only say which one is the best Metallica album, it's easily that one. I would say two or three of us in this house all have Metallica uh, shirts that have uh, Master Puppets on it. There are other Metallica shirts, but that that that's the shirt that has the most Master Puppets in the house. Yeah, <laughs> it's a couple of us here. And something See? about that album, the way it's mixed, is very perfect, whatever that mm -hmm. means. Um, yeah. They didn't start making sonic statements like no bass and bad snare drums till later. Uh, Master of Puppets was like, okay, this is the album, and here's how it sounds brutal and powerful in the speakers. Because it, it's a very basic mix, too. It's not, that's the thing about it. It's, in a way, it's kind of not raw, but it's not, because remember how glossy all the albums were back then, too? They got to a point where, like, you can love the album. You, like listen to like the first Skid Row album and then like listen to like Slave the Grind like you, you start hearing the difference the, in the production at that point yeah. with the albums how how you know, from poppy to heavy or you know what I'm saying how you just start change, changing it up that album didn't really have that glossy feel it just felt very open it was just right it had the right amount of reverb on the snare it had the, the guitar solos were right nothing's long nothing's too short it's just honest I guess and sure the other albums before that were honest too but this one sounded uh refined I don't know it felt like the songs had more breathing room, like in each, between each note. Maybe they started giving a yeah. little more space or time. Something about it. It was. I agree. It's, it's pretty yeah. good. All right, Nikki, you get your. Is it actually your last one? The last one. Okay. 
believe I didn't really mean to lump it in with the other Avenged earlier, but Avenged Sevenfold's Waking the Fallen, which was their second album before right. City of Evil. And I know, you know, most people jumped on with City of Evil, but I started with Waking the Fallen and it has a much His vocals were different, right? His vocals were a lot different at that time, right? Yeah, he would, uh, he would sing a lot of the verses I'm sorry, seeing the choruses, but there was a lot of screaming in the verse. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was a huge fan of that. I was into a Treyu and a bunch of bands that did all the scream, the verses, seeing the choruses. I was all into that. Uh -oh. Yeah. Oh, did we, there oh, we there go. go. Now we're back. And, uh, so I didn't really know what they looked like at that point. I think my friend, one of my friends just brought over a bunch of her CDs and she's like, here, just burn these for yourself and listen to them. And that's the first time I heard of him Sevenfold was they were still kind of underground and- Without Sinister Gates? He was in that one. Oh, okay. He wasn't, he, yeah, he was not on the very first sounding the seventh trumpet. They got him to come back and play like one solo on that one for an intro. But he, you could tell Zachy, the other guitar player wrote a lot of Unholy, like on Unholy Confessions. The riffs were much more, not punk, but a little heavier not it was definitely not as polished it wasn't they weren't on warner brothers yet so they were doing you know the whole goth kind of it was just a lot darker and i loved the vibe uh i won't see you tonight part one probably one of my favorite songs of all time it was the more it was like the ballad of the album and i just I'll have to go back and do it now yeah it starts out with piano and then into the guitar solo and i just melted my heart just it was i was instantly in love i was like i think this is probably my favorite band now and then killer solo again at the end of the song and then it goes into part two and then it's all screaming and craziness and just the whole album lots of guitar harmonies lots of solos still not like city of evil just a lot heavier and i absolutely loved it what about um so i feel it was city of evil it was it hail the king Where's yeah the that what about that what do you feel about that one because i remember hearing that i'm like a lot of the riffs yeah. to me i'm gonna say to me before you even say anything I've heard those riffs before. Like I, I was literally picking out. Like I'm uh, like, that's a that's a, literally a Metallica song. Yeah. They did the temp. They true. did the template. They did the template where they go, oh, that's the BPM. Yeah. It has this feel right here, and then it goes to this thing. There was a Guns N' Roses song. There was a Megadeth song. There was a, a kind of ACDC ish. There was the Metallica one. Most importantly, yeah. there wasn't the Rev anymore, who was a well, badass yeah. in that band. I think yeah. that's one of the reasons that there was lacking. It, it, on that, that album. was the was... first time that they they used their new drummer Aaron for that album yeah. and it was I love a lot of the songs at the end of that album like Acid Rain I thought was beautiful and definitely not my favorite album of theirs but I grew to like it there's some good songs on there once you get it's past the first... a left turn though to me it was not you know yeah. they they you could definitely tell because with Nightmare before that uh yeah Nightmare that the Rev the drummer yeah, had a lot of that before he died, and you could tell. Obviously, That's probably why it's badass. <laughs> when after he passed, you could definitely tell that his presence was not there for the songwriting anymore. So that was I like a, City. And I, I, and I went back to yeah. this stuff. I'm like, ah, the vocals aren't so much. I like what he's doing now with it. You know, and that was a popular album, and I hate that yeah. it was popular. I just happen to like that mixture of their sound. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, I everybody else did too. Cool. Yeah, I think he also had some uh, throat, throat surgery problem, yeah. too. Because I can't. I don't think he can really scream as much. He'll do it. No, I think he's, 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 yeah. I remember that too. Like he yeah. couldn't sing, or he's going to lose his voice, so he had to sing, and by default. Yeah. I don't, know if that, I don't know if that was a story because at the time you really couldn't back stuff up. You know. Yeah. I mean, kind I, of... I've read that he said that you know it was always supposed to be a natural progression, the way that it went out from the screaming, because the very first album is almost the sounding the seventh trumpet is almost all screaming. Or he's very. I think he might kind of sing a little bit on one song, and it's very uh more much more so cal yeah. punk that very first one i'm gonna so. say my i'm gonna say so i'll say my last one and, and you know patrick's gonna bring it home i'm gonna say danzig's uh album before i got punched and knocked out in the video before i had a good laugh at it with a, <laughs> carrying, the, carrying the kitty litter and and all yeah. the stuff yeah i'm talking <laughs> like she rides and, and mother when it first first came out i mean that, yeah. that album to me was just so basic but dark and evil and the and i like the production i thought that was a good solid album to me that was yeah. very Sabbathy, which yeah. I love. And actually, James Hetfield was on the album too, which you don't realize until later on. Oh wow, nice! Oh, he was billed as something else, another person. 
Oh, Will they both go, oh yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think because of the label, they couldn't give him credit because he's on a different label or something, something stupid. Oh, you know, okay. Out backwards, yeah. Huh. So. All right, Patrick, your last one. You remember what it is? I do. Um, yeah, I went in chronological old school order of first. Uh, I just heard so you singing this song today, too. I just, I just heard, I was listening to you guys, you, you just see the song, too. Oh, okay, fast. Uh, let me see. Here's my story. So uh, it's early 90s. I have a fake ID. I'm not quite 21 yet, close, but not. Um, and I want to go see the band Extreme. They had the huge hit More Than Words, but they're still playing clubs. And I love the guitar player, Nino Betancourt, had their albums. An unknown Seattle band opened up for them. Alice in Chains, they were- I saw the tour too. Yeah, they, it, they're, they're uh, Man in the Box is not on the radio yet. Yes, yeah, I remember that, yeah. We Die Young is on Z-Rock, which is some kind of broadcast show. And I heard We Die Young, I was like, ooh, guitar riff sounds cool, you know? Um, and like you said, a lot of the hair bands weren't putting out great albums. So it made a lot of sense when you heard something cool like the intro riff to We Die Young. So I show up early enough to see Alice in Chains uh, and it has a Sabbath vibe right away. They're playing stuff off the first album. And then it has a lot of vocal harmonies with Jerry Cantrell. I didn't know his name was Jerry Cantrell. And I'm like, ooh, Sabbath vocal harmonies. Good idea. Sounds cool. Sounds weird and cool. Um, and they ended up getting booed because Lane Staley did a joke before Queen of the Rodeo. They were still playing Queen of the Rodeo, oh, wow. which didn't make the first album. No. And he's, he did the we're in Texas, oh. it's only got steers and queers. I ain't seen no steers, you know? And of course, San Antonio has a very macho Hispanic population. They don't like hearing that. The joke wasn't lost on me. I thought it was funny. Uh, so people started booing them, not throwing stuff, but booing them. And I'm like, oh, they play Queen of the Rodeo. I'm thinking, wow, that sounds like Dangerous Toys. You know, hearing that song, Queen of the Rodeo, come to find out they were very into Dangerous Toys before they got there. It's crazy how their songs have changed. They're another band though, right? How their songs went from one to year. Like, how did you get from point A to point B? Like, how did you do Queen and then get to the end of the box? Like, I don't see a progression. They were probably influenced, I'm guessing they were influenced by their atmosphere and surrounding and their friends in, in all these other bands, Mud Honey or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, uh, I was, that night, I said, that is an amazing band. I'm committed to to going to get that record i went and bought the cd and it was facelift and it came in a long box um videotape too right after that man in the box hit radio and mtv and of course the rest is history uh blown away and then so by the time the dirt album came out once again i loved their first album i thought oh well, what are they how are they going to follow up the greatness that is bleed the freak um you know, everything on there, We Die Young, all that stuff. Uh, and then the first single is Them Bones with that badass video. The song's in a weird timing. It's got this six, eight, three, four feel over the riff. And then the harmonies happen and the video looks like the song sounds. And I was like, okay, that's amazing. So went and got- It's a hard song to cover too, like replicate, like back then, like it yeah. was like a Raj band song. You could not do Alice in Chains justice. Like back then you could increase Priest or whatever. But like nowadays, you guys are you more talented. But like yeah. when you're younger, that's not a first song. Yeah, so yeah. I got I got dirt and I could sing harmonies. I was already playing in bands. I had the cool band in town, the stupid glam band that was cool. I, I wasn't the singer. I was always the guitar player, but I was always the guy that would sing all the harmonies for any song, whatever it was, originals or covers. Uh, and when I got dirt, the harmonies were weird thirds and fifths and things underneath the high vocal. And I gravitated towards it, you know, the part in Rooster, here they come to snuff the rooster, all the low shit and the stuff in Sick Man and those badass songs. And so that album was my Bible for my harmonization that people hear in our acoustic things that we do mm -hmm. in the Heaven Below stuff. I was even doing it in Union Underground stuff. I do all those harmonies. Um, that Dirt album, if you ever want to learn how to sing harmonies, uh, not properly, but in a cool way, Put on dirt, sing the, sing all the harmonies on any of those songs, you know, um, Hate to Feel or, or Godsmack or whatever. Uh, not the band Godsmack, the song Godsmack. No, and, I know. <laughs> and it's, that's the, to me, that's the holy grail of that whole Seattle scene is dirt for sure to me. So that's He layered why. his voices. Did you know that? In, in, like Lane, he layered, I mean, obviously Jerry's voice is like, you know, a big part of the sound. 
Yeah. But Lane's voice is layered in some of their songs, like on and on and on. It's so it's, haunting. It's crazy. Junkhead. Oh my God. The harmony vocals and Junkhead, you know, that's, that's. Even as messed up as he was at the end, he was still, I read a book, uh, last, they had a book out. Um, what's it yeah. called now? It's a really good book. It talks a lot about their singing and the sound and stuff they came up with. And yeah. it really, it's, it's so surprising they came up with such a beautiful mixture. It's. I, I don't know how he did that high. I don't do a good job when mm -hmm. I've had a pharmaceuticals or I've experimented with drugs. I'm not, I'm not very um, creative at those times for me. I'm in a haze and I don't, I can't, I can't feel, I can't feel the music that I'm mm -hmm. trying to make. So I don't know how Lane Staley did it. He felt the music and could do it on the, under the influence. Um, but that album is just, uh, that's the Holy Grail for sure. For yeah, harmony right. vocal or the whole scene yeah. of that. They were, they were crazy. They had, two, they had the two EPs at the time. And I remember the first one, I saw them also for the tour. So I was, you know, more of the words I'm like, eh. but like, but Nuno with like Decadence and all his guitar playing was just ridiculously, right? I'm like, all right. And then I remember getting a sampler of Alice in Chains. And then I eventually got the uh, the cassette. I think it had like the VHS tape attached to it. And I think it had like a shirt too. It was like you, a three that, point, that was a production. I got facelift and mine didn't come with the VHS. And my friend later, one of my friends that I, I had it for a long day. time. Yeah, I got my copy. It came with this live show, and I was like, "Damn it, I didn't get my yeah, live show." Yeah, I had show. like a couple black and white shows, and it also had like "Sea Sorrow" and I think "Man in the Box" and like yeah. one other song in there. It was it was a great little promo back in the day, and then a shirt too. And later on, they did it with a shirt, so it's pretty cool. I'm yeah, sure worth something now though. Yeah, that was awesome. That's what dreams are made of. That fucking Alice Chains Dirt album, especially vocally. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. So we've talked about some kick-ass bands, but you guys are also done some kick-ass bands. Let's just end it up by let's talking. What else you guys got going on? Well, Nikki just started, well, is starting her full yeah. song album and yeah. via her Patreon as well. Yes, yeah. finally. I just started that up. Um, Bravo. It's basically, you know, social media is so limiting. I know people are like, why, why are you doing that? Well, because I have people ask me, oh, you have an album out? For you yeah a couple of years mm -hmm. oh i haven't seen you post anything about it oh i was you know people just don't see stuff on facebook i haven't seen you post in a couple of weeks they're all up there so facebook not just facebook but all social media is just super limiting with the algorithms and everything so yeah. figured you know oh, what I you that. if you really want to be a part of it and, and make sure you see everything i've decided patreon is really a good tool for that you just get a bunch of the behind the scenes stuff that you know the, a lot of the raw demos and stuff that i don't really want out there everywhere yeah you know, if you're a real fan of it you get to come along for the journey and so far it's been cool i, I think the process is cool a lot of music fans are going to do that are going to enjoy yeah. the creative process be like oh you know what i mean yeah because like us we love the demos i look to hear other bands oh, do their demos yeah. and listen back down and be like oh that's how Dr. Fielder came about with different lyrics or so so hearing yeah. you do demos and then evolve into something else is a great thing yeah. for a fan. You know? I shared a couple um, from my two previous songs. I was like, here's a, my very, very rough demo that I gave to my producer, Jesse, to get across the idea so he could do the drums. And it's just, it was me on a, on my little drum looper machine thingy on my laptop. And I did a very rough thing for the drums because I'm definitely not a drummer. And I just used GarageBand and I sat and I did that. I did, I don't even think I have bass on those and it was just that and guitars. And I gave that to Jesse and then he played the drums and, and built the song around that. And for people to hear those, some of the vibes completely changed once we got the drums in and it, they took on a different life and a different groove. So, so far people have really been enjoying hearing. Yeah, hey, I think it's awesome. I'm so glad to hear you do that. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. And now you guys are trying to play out a little bit. What, are, what else is going on with you, uh, Patrick, there? Uh, awaiting the Lita dates. There's a Lita Ford album that's uh, looking like it's finally getting wrapped up. Uh, there's Lita dates I see at the end of the year happening. I know the Maidens yeah. also, but in the meantime, wrapped up. Did you guys, did you guys record anything yet? Or is it like you already started doing it or I don't know. The Lita that. stuff? Yeah. Lita did, did it with Gary Hoey. Oh, uh, that's right. The guitar player, uh, producer. Did, did a couple, couple together, right? Got Bobby Rock on drums yeah. on that. Yeah, me and Marty don't play on the album. I do some backing vocals on some of the songs, but between Lita and Gary Hoey, they got yeah, it. Yeah, he's got covered. Yeah, and uh, I don't know when that's coming out, but I know it's getting there. I know that Max Norman, I'm probably not allowed to say, it, Max Norman is uh, mixing it right now. Uh, and then for Heaven Below, we are going to be releasing 
kind of like a greatest hits, not that we have hits, but we're, we're uh, long story short, we've been getting a lot of attention with the band, not only with Nikki in it, not only because I play with Lita Ford, not only because of William Shatner singing on subdivisions, we've decided let's do a comprehensive vinyl and CD and digital release that kind of is the best of all the stuff we've put out. Uh, and it's called We Sold Our Souls for Heaven Below. It'll have a new track. It's a duet with me and Nikki. Um, well, I say duet like it's going to be Captain and Tennille. Yeah. Or, or like it's, gonna, yeah. it's not like that. It's not going to be? Forget it. I don't want it. I, it's, yeah. a lot, yeah, it's a lot darker. It's a lot darker yeah. than that. It's darker yeah, it's got a song called Demons we recorded, but that's going to be coming out hopefully later this year. We Sold yeah. Our Souls for Heaven Below. Of course, I stole the title from Black Sabbath. Well, the fact uh, you're gonna have it on vinyl, you already, you already have me sold. I'm already like, here's my yeah. money. You know. Yeah, and then we're playing acoustic yeah. shows together. Our first acoustic show we yeah. have next month. Next month in Arizona. Uh, right. You've yeah. seen us doing our acoustic couch. Yeah, of course I have. The, I love the them. The down it got like a million and five, uh, 1.5 million views, something outrageous. Yeah. So uh, who knew? Who knew people want to hear us do that? So we're gonna do some shows while things are starting to open up. Yeah. We figure. Fine. Festivals aren't there. Big shows. Well, we'll come play a, a local exactly. bar. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be doing that in Tucson. The Maidens are playing Friday. Then we're playing our acoustic thing Saturday during the day. And then I play with the Maidens again that night. So yeah, it's right. the Maidens are... fun And the Maidens can... have some new merch out. You guys have yeah. like socks and, and masks. I was, I was like, I told Limits, you guys can get some of the jammy jams or something too. You're Iron Maiden, you got a whole, a whole get up there, awesome. huh? Yeah, right. Masks, socks, and I think magnets. I think we got magnets too. We got mugs. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I went over there and checked it out. There's some good stuff. Yeah. I'll uh, post that too. I'll put everything underneath there. I, oh. You know, Hell yeah. All this stuff. All this stuff is awesome. I already have enough merch from you guys. So bring it on. Let's get some more stuff out there. You know. Right. I'm gonna say my favorite thing I have actually is the hat. It's the, uh, the Marilyn Monroe devil hat there. That's probably my favorite oh, okay. thing. Okay. Oh, the yeah. most. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So it's, it's made so well. I love the fact it's distressed, so it's kind of cool looking. I know. Yeah, I love, love that. Yeah. I, like, I love the hats. And yeah. it's not cheap made, and, and I'm saying to people watching, the, the merchandise, the logo piece, is, it's, it's all, it's made really well, though, so it doesn't feel like it's going to fall off, you know what I mean? It feels like it's lived yeah. in, but it's not, it's really not made well, so you really feel like you get your bank for your buck. Yeah, that's one. important to us, especially with music being, well, I wouldn't call it free, but music being so accessible now. Now, in my opinion, now the merch better be goddamn good yeah, because yeah. people are not going to Walmart or Target to buy a hard rock heavy metal yeah. album. And it took us a no. while to figure out which hat to go with too. We we could not figure out. We researched, out. we're yeah. like, what hat is it? And we're we like, it's a distressed it. hat with this and that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm picky. I don't wear a lot of hats very often. So when I do though, there's been a few times on some of the shows you'll probably see me wearing. I'm like, that was, as I said, shoveling or something, a really bad day. I'm like, I'm gonna need to wear a hat. Oh, I'm gonna yeah. have to wear it. And that, you'll see this, the hat on the show because that's, yeah. uh, yeah. that's my go-to hat. Yeah. All right, so I want to thank you guys for being the show and sharing everything on this lengthy show. But we talked about some really good bands, and I, I got a lot of homework. I go back and listen to some of these bands, AFI, and I go back with the Pop Roach yeah. now. And <laughs> I'm gonna go put on that some... Yes album. The Yes album is yeah. getting put on. I, I am serious. You got to listen to this some early Yes, but you got to be totally oh, yeah. like in headphones too. You got to listen to it stereo though. It's very, you know, chill. Nice. All right, well, nice. all right you guys. Thank you very much, and you guys have a good night. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Sean. All right, all right take care. So bye. All right, bye bye. Bye.